Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to Community United Methodist Church this morning, members. And we give a special welcome to our guests, any guests that are here for our returning. Or if this is your first time, we praise God for that. And we are welcome to have you in God's house this morning. So uh, I do have a couple of announcements at this time. Not many, but uh, it was brought to my attention that the bulletin has us the United Methodist Men meeting on the 2nd and the 9th. That's not true. We will meet on Wednesday, October the 9th, 7 a.m. over here in the Fellowship of Life. So, uh, and we've been kind of, uh, we discontinued during the summer months, so we're back on. And every, every Wednesday, 2nd Wednesday, we will meet. So be there and uh, have fun with that. Also, uh, we had our last first service today uh, for the summer, and that is moving and changing. And it has been a true blessing, uh, a wonderful thing to go through. Our praise band has been devoted, done a wonderful job of that. But Dustin and the contemporary service group are moving now on October the 9th to 6 p.m for our contemporary service. And there will be other uh, activities and uh, things for children, adults, choir, different people in the, or in the church to do after we have our snacks, our devotional, our praise singing, then we will break into other types of groups. So keep that in your prayers. That is very, very important. So if you would, uh, I think that's all the announcements that I have at this time. Uh, one thing I would want to add is we are starting our Advent devotional. And please look that over, over here in the back of the church, after the service today, and sign up for Advent devotionals for this year. Uh, if you would pray with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come this morning and worship in your house. We ask that blessings be disposed of, uh, given to this service, those that are participating, Dustin, Melba, and our choir, please be with them, all those that work with our children. Let this be your hour, a time that we worship you. Forgive us where we fail you, dear God, we do pray you often. All these things I ask in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would please stand and turn to page 805, we will have our call to worship. You will follow along either on the screens or in your hymnal. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs and deeds for the course of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy of the living God. O Lord of hosts, my ruler and my God, at your altars even the sparrow finds a home, and the sparrow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Blessed are those who dwell in the house ever singing your praise. Melba will lead us in our song. Please turn in your hymnal to number 384, or you can uh, watch the words on the screen within the first four stanzas. The first three stanzas.
Um, and I just want to say um, a personal thanks to all those in the church that reached out to me in the last 24 hours to remind me of that score yesterday. Um, it's close to my heart. And there's always basketball season around the corner for Texas Tech. So that's all I'll say. If you guys could come forward during this time. And if you would join me in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are the giver of all gifts that are good. I pray that as we give a portion back of what you have given to us, that you would help this church to use it to glorify your name, to expand your kingdom, and to bring about your word into this community. We ask these things in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. talking about tech, so um, Murray is going to get up every month. We talk about one of the missions that we support in the community, and so Murray is going to talk about our Lincoln County Food Bank. Thank you, Dustin. It's a short subject when you talk about tech football. on behalf of the food bank. Uh, Lou is our representative from our church to the food bank and I personally thank you for your service to that and your help. As far as the Lincoln County Food Bank goes, over 20 members of this church are attendees. Uh, donate their time to pick up, mark, if you, if you work at the food bank, you know what marking means. They are volunteer at the food bank each month. And as volunteers, this church gives hundreds of hours of service to the food bank each year. And I do appreciate Lou as a representative once again. Our church supports the food bank with canned food drives. Our boys, our, our scouting programs support this. We have financial donations that support this. And uh, it is just, it's just very clear to me that our church believes in an important mission of providing food to people throughout Lincoln County. Very, very important thing. The food bank related, relies totally on our local support. It does. And a church, uh, this is a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge each year to meet the budgets. And anytime you've got a few extra dollars floating around, the food bank would appreciate any help. Or you've got a few pieces of canned goods or stocks, we appreciate it. Just drop it off at any time. We appreciate that. And it is, we also try to have a presence in the community, such as Aspen Fest. We will have booths, symposium, cowboy symposium. There will be booths to raise public awareness in our area. So everything is greatly appreciated. The board of directors, people that work, and I just you know I, I look out amongst you and there are many faces that I see working at Food Bank each week right here amongst us today. So remember this in closing. Community United Methodist Church is vital to the success of the Lincoln County Food Bank. And we need to keep it before us always and keep it in our prayers. So uh, blessings to you. And thank you very much for Dustin to Dustin for allowing us to give this mission moment. Thank you. If you would please rise for the doxology. <laughs>
number 545, the church is one foundation. I'm going to do a little <coughs> sneaky thing here. We're going to see the first and second verses out of 545. And then if you look on page 546, we're going to sing the last verse out of there. Or you can just read it on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> the church is one foundation. <laughs> Father, we just give you thanks and praise for all of the joys that we have going on in our lives and for living in a place such as this, at a time such as this, in the beauty in the midst of your creation. We just give you thanks. And yet, Father, at the same time, we know that so many of us come before you have hurting, full of angst and worry and stress and so, and so many things of this world. And so I just ask that during this time that you would just help us to shed these things that are keeping us down and allow us to, pay, have to partake more of your joy and peace. And Father, we pray specifically for those that need your loving guidance today. So we ask for them by name right now. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, hear our prayers.
Father, we pre pray that you be with each and every one of these names and places and situations. We know that you are the God that knows all and hears all. So be with us as we cry out to you and pray the prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins.
Beautiful. Now our children are going to be dismissed to the uh, children's church. That's four-year-olds to fifth grade. And if you would like to be encouraged and guided to go over there. For the rest of us, let's stand and do our affirmation of faith. Apostle Street, down on 881 or on the screen. You would follow with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and was crucified by the and Mary. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We're saying who we are, 
And when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, we're making a big statement about who we are as followers of Jesus Christ and who we are as a church. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, this is a little weird because we're a Methodist church, right? And we believe in the Catholic Church, aren't they the ones down the street? Nobody has ever thought that? Yeah. yeah. It's like, why would the Methodists say they believe in Catholic? Like, yeah, they're... I want to just define a few key words for you, if that's okay, in my nerdiness, so that we can try to be on the same page about what we're talking about. So I want to start off by talking about what the church is. The church in Greek comes from the word ekklesia, which comes from two different words, ek, which means out of, or from, or kaleo, and which is the verb, to be called out. And so the word means to be called out of, to be called from. Um, in Hebrew, it came from a word that meant assembly. I'm not going to pronounce it because Hebrew has those glurals. Have y'all heard people speak Aramaic? And it's like, I just can't do that. Um, so the Hebrew word means to assemble or congregate together, which is why you get your term assembly or congregation, right? It's like, oh, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Well, the Greek means we're called out of. So the church is the people of God that are called out of their everyday lives to assemble together to come and worship God. Because that's who you are today, right? Like, an hour and a half ago, we weren't together. You were on your way to doing getting ready. Um, yesterday, you are watching college sports, which we won't talk about anymore. Um, whatever was going on, especially all you OU fans, me. <laughs> And by the grace of God, this morning, you felt a special call on your life to get out of bed, even though some of us wanted to sleep in, right? And you came, and we gathered together as an assembly, as a congregation, to worship God. That's what the church is, those that are called out of our lives so that we can worship God. We believe in one holy Catholic, Catholic man, and that's a big one. Because a lot of times in our society today, when we think Catholic, we think the Roman Catholic Church. And I want to make a distinction. There is the Roman Catholic Church, which is about 100 and maybe three, 400 yards down the street, right? And they gather together every Sunday at 10 a.m. and they have Mass, and they have Mass throughout the week. And that is different than the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church is over there. The Catholic Church means something different. I'm a Catholic at its very root means that which concerns the whole. So it's something that is the whole of the body. So it's not just a small part of it, but it's a, the whole thing. So like it's not a piece of pizza, but it's the whole pizza. Do you get the picture? Good. Well, when we say we believe in the whole church, what we're saying is that we believe that we are not the only ones that have the truth of the gospel. We're not the only church that's ever existed. We stand in a long line of people that have come before us. And we give thanks for those people. And so we are Catholic. Right? Like we, like you are a Catholic Christian if you believe that. Because I believe that there is more than just Methodists that believe in the triune God. I believe there are more than just Methodists that know and understand and believe and worship Jesus Christ. And because of that, I believe there's a bigger church that stretches across all tribes and tongues and nations and language and cultures that's gone from, what, 1980-ish years ago when Jesus died and was ascended to now. It's existed since then to now. And that's what I say when we say Catholic. And I know on the screen that there's a little asterisk. Have y'all ever noticed it? And it says universal. Well, why don't we just say universal, Dustin? Any of y'all ever thought that? Well, one, we're out of Universal Studios. Um, we actually, I was at a church, Ashley and I visited one time, that said at Universal, but to me, there's also um, connotations with that word um, that come along with it. So there are the Unitarian Universalists, which are a denomination as well, that believe that all paths and all ways lead to God, and that's not um, what the Methodist Church believes. We believe in Jesus Christ. And so there's connotations with that word as well as connotations with Catholic. And so I continue to choose the word Catholic because that means that we're a part of the whole body of Christ. We're a small fragment of what the body of Christ is. You can tell us anyway. Am I boring y'all with that yet? Good. <laughs> I just got two more. I'll try to keep a little bit shorter. Church, Catholic, holy. In Hebrew, the root of the word holy, it means to cut to separate. 
Holy means that we are set apart, that we are different. That means that we should be different than those that are around us. We should be different than the world. We are set apart. And the last word, or the last little phrase, is the communion of the saints. We believe in the communion of the saints. You are a saint. Whether you know it or not, whether somebody's told you in a while, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you are a saint. Now, that doesn't mean that you're a Saints fan and you're going to root for them when they tell you the Cowboys today. But it does mean that you are set apart by God and called his beloved son and daughter. So when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, what we're saying is, I believe that there is one universal church. There is one large church. We are a part of the wholeness of that. That God has called us out and set us aside to be his sons and his daughters so that we can live out in the world differently than the rest of people. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. When Paul was instructing his disciple Timothy, um, in 1 Timothy, Murray read it for us earlier this morning, Paul told him this. Timothy was an early leader of the church. And he said, I hope to come to you soon, because, um, but I'm writing these things so that you may know that if I am delayed, um, you ought how people ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. What he's saying is that I'm writing to you so that you can help other people know how to behave in the household of God. Paul is saying that what the church is like is the church is like one big family. And the way I like it is if we're a big family, then our local church that we're a part of, that's our immediate family. Right? And some of us had good immediate families growing up, and some of us not so good. But that's who we are, and you choose to be a part of this immediate family and to partake in it, and we have sometimes brothers or sisters that we fight with in the local church, right? Oh, we all don't want to admit that, do you? Yeah, sometimes we don't always agree and we want to get our ways, but we're still a family. Through thick and thin, and that's what the local church is, is that we gather together as the household of God, and we say, hey, we're going to be with you through thick and thin. And that's in the membership vows when you pray to, when you say you'll support the church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. You're saying you're going to be here and you're going to support us. And then I ask the congregation, I say, and now church, are you going to support them in their spiritual lives? And you say, yes, yes right? Now, whether you believe it or not, or act it out, but that's what we're saying is we're going to take you in. You're going to be a part of our larger family. And the global United Methodist Church, right, so if we have the local churches, our brothers and sisters and parents, the global United Methodist Church are kind of like our aunts and uncles. So they're like us. They have the same DNA, the same upbringing that we basically had, but it's just us on a wider scale. One of the whole reasons that I'm a United Methodist minister is because we believe that we can do more together as a global denomination than we can do apart. Right, so there's more good that we can do as all of God's children across the world than just this one little body can do by itself. When I first entered the ministry in 2004, the United Methodist Church was a part of something called Imagine It No Malaria. I don't know if y'all remember that. That was a while ago. Anybody? Like, yeah, if you're good. I used to have a shirt that said, like, mosquitoes suck, right? Because, and it was a part of a campaign that was partnered with the NBA, and the United Methodist Church worked with the NBA, who provided bed nets throughout Africa, as well as education and training on how that they could treat and escape malaria. Within 10 years, the deaths in malaria in Africa decreased by over 50% because of the pursuit of the Methodist Church and what we were doing in Africa because we worked together for the glory of God. That's some good news, right? Amen. We can do more together as a whole. And that's who our global church is. And each family has cousins, right? You have some cousins in your family. And this is kind of like the other denominations, the Roman, like the Roman Catholic Church down the street or the Church of Christ over here. They're like our cousins. They're a part of the family as well. And you know what? Every family has a crazy cousin. You know that, right? <laughs> And if you don't know who the crazy cousin is in your family, that means it's probably you. <laughs> and there are some 
denominations and some churches that are a little bit out there, I would say. But that doesn't mean they're not a part of our family. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to come alongside them and work together so that we can benefit the community of Rodoso and the world together. That we don't believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our Savior. What it means is that, yeah, they're probably just a little bit further out there than we are. I mean, after all, we are a little methodical, right? <laughs> like, that's our name, a Methodist. <laughs> That's what we are, as we are a part of the larger family of God. Sister Sledge said it pretty well in the 70s. <laughs> right? We are family. I got all my sisters with me. Well, I only have brothers, but still. We are family. Come on, everybody, get up and sing. No? <laughs> See? Exactly. And that's who we are as the body of Christ. And when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, we're saying that we are a larger part of what we're a smaller part of the whole. And that if they say they're Christians, then they're our brothers and our sisters. They are our family. And man, that is some good news. Paul continues on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and he talks about what makes up the church. Throughout Christian history, there have been two main pillars of what makes a church. And Paul tells us the first one here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He says, the, um, the living God, who is the pillar and buttress of the truth, and great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness, that Christ was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. You know what Paul's doing? He's saying that what the church does is we proclaim the word. He is proclaiming the word of God, the mystery of God. And this is the first mark of what a church is, is we are a people that gather together to proclaim the word of God. Hopefully that's what I'm doing right now, right? Is I am speaking what God has done. One of my goals as a pastor has been and always will be, will be 100% completely unoriginal in my preaching. Because I want to stand on the foundation of the truth that has come on before me. One of my professors in seminary, he said, he didn't say it like this, but this is how I interpreted it. He said, Dustin, he said it for the whole class, but I picture myself as being his favorite student. If you're studying for your sermon and um, I read commentaries and you're reading books and you're reading the Bible, and you think to yourself, you have some divine revelation, you're like, wow, I've never heard this before, and wow, I've never read this before. Your first thought should not be like, wow, I am so spiritual and God is speaking to me. He said, no, your first thought should be, you're a heretic. <laughs> and that stood out with me, because he's like, think about it. The Holy Spirit has been working in people's lives for over 1900, well, since the beginning of time. And all of a sudden, he's going to come and magically reveal some mystery of the universe to me? probably not that special. So my goal as a pastor in proclaiming the word is to stand upon the history and orthodoxy of the church and to be completely and utterly unoriginal. And your job as people who are a part of the church is to proclaim the world or proclaim the word to the world. The word being Jesus Christ. And that's what we proclaim. We proclaim the message of Jesus Christ to those that aren't yet part of us. The first mark of the church is that we are people that are word-centered. My first ordination vow, right, for the Methodist ministers in the room, the first thing we're ordained to do is word. And the second, the second mark of the chat tech, or the second mark of the church, the second thing that we're ordained to is the sacraments. There's two traditional sacraments that most churches across time and space have recognized. The sacrament of communion. Were we to gather together to celebrate the Lord's Supper, to remember that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. To realize that even though Christ has died, that we are an Easter people because we know that Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. Early service person, got it. Right? <laughs> That's our saying as Easter people. That's what we say every Easter, and I'm trying to get you to remember that we're Easter people all throughout the year, so when we say Christ has risen, we know that Christ has risen. 
And in the sacrament of communion, that's what we gather together to do as we remember that one evening Christ sat along with his disciples and had a meal with them. Where his body and blood was sacrificed so that we could have communion with God. In our early service, that's why we did communion every week is so that we could remember that on a weekly basis. And in this service, the reason we do it on a monthly basis is actually because of the history of the Methodist people. You see, in our history, we have circuit riders who were ordained elders who couldn't be in every town at all the times. So they would make the circuit, and when the elder got to the town, they would have communion when the elder was there. I'm an elder in the United Methodist Church, right? I mean, who would believe it? And I've actually prayed for elements for other churches so that they could have communion because they didn't have elders there. And so the reason we do it on a month isn't because it's some like historical theological statement. It's because we didn't have the pastors back in the day to do it every week. We take communion to remember who Christ is and what Christ has done for us so that we can partake in his suffering. And the second is baptism. Baptism is the initiation into the Christian life, into the Christian church. It's a time where we say, yes, this is what I believe, and I am going to live my life out according to these beliefs. We say, I'm going to take off the old, gunky stuff of my past and put on the newness of who Christ is, and I want to be a part of the church universal. John Calvin, man, a Methodist quoting John Calvin, he once said there is no salvation apart from the church. Because he knew that in baptism, when we gather together, what we need to do is gather together as his body, being one people. These are the marks of the church. These two simple things make us who we are, proclaiming the word and administering the sacraments. Now, Thomas Oden, a Wesleyan um, a theologian and historian, actually argues for a third point, and I don't know if I'm going to agree with him, but I want to mention it as well, because I've actually snuck it into every sermon in the series so far. He says a third mark of the church is discipline. If you've heard any of the sermons in the series before, hopefully you've, talked, you've heard me talk about Richard Foster and the spirit of discipline, the celebration of disciplines. And, you know, last week I talked about meditation. I remember that, and I crossed my legs, and... No? Were you here? Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure I haven't bored you today. Richard Foster, in this work, he talks about the corporate disciplines. And in the corporate disciplines, yes, there is worship. And at first, I was going to talk about worship today because that's what the church does is we gather together to worship God. And you've all heard my saying is we come together to worship and glorify God because the church doesn't exist to um, succumb to the will of individuals, but we're here to glorify God. And you haven't heard me say that once. You haven't listened to me for that long. But what I really want to talk to you today about is a celebration. Because I think a lot of what's missing from the modern church today is that we simply don't celebrate enough. Right? We gather together, and it's nice to see people, but we just... And we need to celebrate. We need to rejoice when God does something good in our lives. Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say... Rejoice, rejoice. rejoice. And sometimes I think we as a body need to learn what it means to celebrate, to have a good time. No? Okay. Because Christ calls us to celebrate. Because Christ is risen. Oh, see? And one final thing I have to confess is God calls us to celebrate when times are good and times are bad. And in life of this church right now, things are going pretty well. Um, on Monday night, the church voted, gathered and voted to approve the new design and layout of the building. <laughs> That's something to celebrate. Y'all have been working on this for longer than I've been alive, I think, right? So. <laughs> and not only that is... We have enough money in the bank to pay for the building on hand. That's amazing news. I've got to be a pastor and say we have enough money to pay for the building, but we still need money for the furnishings, the AV, the landscaping, and things like that. So, you know, don't stop giving to it. We appreciate your generosity. But God is doing amazing things in and through that process. Anna and I were looking at some numbers last week, and year-to-date, our attendance is up, not just from last year, 
But this is the highest attendance we've had year to date since 2012. That's good news, right? <laughs> and our year to date giving is up since 2000, it's as high as it's been since 2011. So that's even better, right? That's like a year older. And look at the local missions that this church does. Look at the Faith Community Health Ministry, Santa Elena. Look at Imagination Station that we host. Look at all the good that our church does. We are church for the community, right? That's some good news. <laughs> and this is why we need to learn how to celebrate. Because some of these things are exciting and good, and now we're like, should we clap or not? <laughs> like, I don't know, serving the poor? We'll see. One of the amazing things that's happened in the last month of this church is an individual made a donation um, to serve in local missions. And he wanted us to work with the school system to provide a dental care for students that can't afford dental care. And so we have $40,000 to work with the schools to go into them and provide braces and cavity fillings and cleanings for students that can't afford that. And so we're starting that right now. And that's some good news, right, church? <laughs> Y'all are going to learn how to celebrate before we get done today. <laughs> because we need to be a people that listen to cool in the game on occasion. And know that we can celebrate good times. Come on. Right? Because if we can't celebrate when times are going good in the church, how are we going to be able to rejoice when times aren't? And I've been a pastor long enough to tell you that this is atypical in the life of the church. The churches typically don't grow. The, it, it's just not normal. And I can be here next year, and I don't think we'll be like, well, we're higher than we were in 2008. Like, I just, I would hope for that. I pray for that. We work for that. But we realize that sometimes things are going well in a church, and sometimes things don't go well in a church. And in the midst of it all, God calls us, Paul tells us to be a people that rejoice. Because when I say I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, what I'm really saying is that I believe in the Holy Spirit that is working in each and every one of you. I believe that God has made you holy, that he has called you to himself, that he has set you apart for his work in this community so that his name will be glorified. When I say I believe in the communion of saints, I believe that God has made you special and unique. He has called you his beloved son and daughter, and he longs for you to worship him and gather together as his church. And I believe that God has amazing things for us as his people if we will continue to listen to him and be guided by him. Because Christ is our good shepherd, and Christ is leading us each and every day. Because I know that at the end of the day, that the church isn't what we're building across the street. But I am the church, and you are the church, and we are the church together. Because I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints, I believe that God will continue to lead us and bless us in his ways. Because I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. What? Do you believe? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for how you were working here in our midst in Rudosa. I thank you for the good that you were doing, and I thank you for the saints that surround me in your work. I pray that you continue to lead us and guide us. Help us to be a part of the Catholic Church, the church that has always existed and will continually always exist in your creation. Help us to work with uh, our brothers and sisters across denominations and across the community so that we can bring about your glory to this place. And we pray for those churches that are meeting this morning. I pray that you lead them and guide them, be with their pastors, be with their leadership, and help us to work together for your unity, for your purpose. And Father, I thank you for this church, for how you are calling us to be a church for our community, for we are community of United Methodist Church. Help us to be your sons and your daughters, the saints that you have called us out of our lives so that your name can be glorified. We ask these things in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And if you want to know more of what it's like to be a part of this church or to live your life for Jesus, I invite you to the altars. They're open, or you can come and find and pray with me at the back. And know if you would please do this in our closing song. Please turn in your hymnal to number 558 and please stand as we stand we are the church.
turn around and receive this invitation. As you leave this place, may you know that you are the church, that God has called you out of your lives to gather together to be his holy sons and daughters in this world. May you go with the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May he be with you now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. And if